allow me to introduce Mr. R. Mr. R is a 55-year-old manager who's worked in a high-stress environment for over 30 years. Now, Mr. R ends up at the hospital after feeling some kind of intense pain in his chest as well as a numbness in his left arm. And the doctors inform him that he has suffered a heart attack and needs to be hospitalized. Here's Mrs. L, a mother of three, retired from teaching in an elementary school. Mrs. L starts experiencing shortness of breath as well as a weird pain in her jaw that spreads to her chest. But the first doctor dismisses her, blaming her symptoms on menopause. But the discomfort doesn't go away. Mrs. L wants a second opinion. And the second doctor tells her after some testing that she has also suffered a heart attack. And finally, here is Mr. M, a physics professor with a special love for the croissants his wife makes. Now, given his family history, he's no stranger to cardiac adverse events. So unfortunately, when he does feel the telltale signs of the chest pains, he knows what it is as he's carted off onto an ambulance. Now, all three of these patients have just suffered an acute event called a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. But thanks to the wonders of medicine, people are now saved from dying from heart attacks when they happen. So the good news is that all three of them make it. They're alive, and that's what matters to their family and friends. But they're not out of the woods yet. Now, science, and by extent, scientists such as myself, are faced with a new problem, the what comes after a heart attack. The incidence of heart failure, which is a chronic disease and amongst the most common afflictions worldwide, has only gotten worse now that patients such as these survive the initial damage. So really, the wonders of modern medicine have their limits, and now, currently, the only way of managing heart failure is through drug administration for the rest of your life. Now, back to our three patients. They all end up on the same medication, even though the respective doctors aren't really sure what kind of clinical outcomes they will have or how they will react to the drugs. So let's fast forward three months ahead and look at the effects of this medication. So Mr. R starts taking the medication, and he immediately feels better. His symptoms for heart failure subside, and he's almost back to normal. Mrs. L, however, starts experiencing nausea, bloating, increased fatigue. As a teacher, she's always valued listening to the opinions of experts and following the rules. But despite her doctor's insistence that this drug will absolutely work after its successful clinical trial, she actually stops taking the medication because she feels all of the negative side effects and none of the benefits that she was promised. Mr. M starts taking the medication, and he thinks he's feeling somewhat better. That's good. But then his doctor informs him that he has to change medications and that they're going to switch him on a new cocktail of very expensive treatments in order to maximize the chances of stabilizing his condition. So for Mr. M, the trial and error process starts all over again. And on some days, he feels more like a guinea pig rather than a person. Now, I've described to you three fictitious people, but the reality is that millions of, world, of, of, of people worldwide are coming into our hospitals and into our clinics with heart failure just like these patients or even other heart diseases. And despite the many promising and, might I add, very expensive clinical trials, there's no cure. And more worryingly yet, there is no universal treatment that works for everyone. And this actually boils down to three main factors. So first, we don't sufficiently understand the patient-specific differences that occur when uh, we're faced with heart injury or drug effects. Number two, we test our drugs in a small sample of recruited patients, which really fails to encapsulate the diversity and complexity of our population. And three, we don't actually have a very reliable model in order to test our drugs before implementing them in humans. So going back to the fundamentals, how do we model a heart? How do we represent this beautiful, infinitely complex system with thousands of blood vessels and different cell types? How do we represent this machine that keeps our brain, our liver, every part of us alive? And conversely, how do we model a diseased heart? Because we need to study it in order to understand the tools, the drugs that we need in order to repair it. 
the truth is we don't actually have that many tools. So I'll go over the couple of, uh, the couple of options that we have before we translate our basic science research into uh, humans. So we have three options. The first one is to use immortalized cell lines. What are immortalized cell lines? Well, someone a while ago took some uh, cells from the heart from a patient, and these cells were actually modified in order to be able to grow. And because they're able to grow and expand, contrarily to our usual heart cells that are actually not able to grow, we are able to sell them commercially throughout the world to scientists such as myself, and I'm able to do dozens, hundreds of experiments on these cells. And that's great. But the problem is that the muscle-like cells in the heart, the ones that we have in our bodies, are not able to grow, they're not able to multiply. So it really makes you question how accurate of a model that really is. The second option is to use uh, heart samples from patients. So that involves going into the person's heart and collecting cells. And if this sounds outlandish to you, it's because it absolutely is. Imagine going up to a person whose heart works at 40% capacity and telling them, I want a sample of your heart. I want a sample of a tissue that inherently does not repair itself for science. <laughs> That's insane. And of course, there's also the problem that even though, this is, uh, even though this is incredibly invasive, it also has the added problem that's inefficient. Because the fact that these cardiomyocytes that are inside of our hearts do not grow, we would never be able to perform any kind of repeatable and meaningful experiments. So that doesn't really work either. The third model that we have is an animal model, notably mice or rats. But I don't really need to remind you that rodents and humans don't really look alike. From the patients that we've seen from the beginning, we see that we're not even able to draw significant conclusions based on different people, and let alone a smaller animal model that has a physiology completely different to ours. So the bottom line is that we're really not able to replicate this. We're really not able to replicate a model of heart failure at, at a patient-specific level. As it stands, the best that we've got is this. And I wish I could tell you right here with a straight face that it's this absolute passion for science emanating from me in this picture that is going to usher in this new age of personalized cardiac repair therapies. But that's actually not it. Unfortunately, it's what I'm holding in my hand, which is a dish. And, what's, and this dish, uh, more precisely what is inside of it, is at the heart of my work. So right here, I'm actually trying to generate a cell model, but that is very specific to patients. So in our world, where drugs are becoming increasingly sophisticated and we're spending millions of dollars funneling it into research in order to have some kind of universal a heart failure drug, we can't really afford generalizing our conclusions based on some kind of lackluster model, like the ones that I've described before, and then having to go back to the drawing board all over again when these drugs inevitably don't work. So we need something that is a lot more concrete. We can't pretend like we live in this vacuum because there's a myriad of factors that make us all up as individuals, our biological sex, our gender, our uh, lifestyle, our diet, our age. All of these things will inevitably impact the way that we react to disease and to treatment. So how does my scientific work fit into the scientific process? How am I trying to advance these personalized therapies? Well, first, I meet with patients at the heart failure clinic, and I draw their, and I, and I take their blood. And if this sounds a lot less invasive than the heart biopsy that we've discussed, it's because it is, and it works a lot better. And so I take this blood, and I isolate a specific cell type, a blood cell, which I'm then able to manipulate and reprogram. What this means is that, thanks to the uh, Nobel Prize-winning work of Dr. Yamanaka and his team, who have discovered these factors, I'm able to introduce these factors, kind of like a script, into the cell, and it tells the cell to revert to its most primitive state. It's kind of like turning back the biological clock on these cells in order to uh, give us kind of a blank slate. And these cells are called stem cells. Now, these stem cells are able to 
become any cell of our body. And contrarily to heart cells, they're actually able to replicate as much as we want them to. And the real advantage to this method is actually the fact that even though these stem cells are technically a blank slate, they still contain the DNA and genetic code of each of the patients, hence the patient specificity that we've been wanting all along. So the next step is to push these stem cells to a new lineage, a new fate. And of course, I'm in cardiovascular repair medicine, so I'm excited about heart cells. And let me tell you, the first time that I did generate these heart cells was probably the most rewarding moment in my entire research career when I saw them beating in culture. It was an indescribable feeling that I wish I could share with you. Um, and what we actually ended up having are mini hearts in a dish. So these mini hearts come from patients and they beat in culture, they behave a little bit like real hearts, and we're able to test different kinds of medications and treatments on them without going directly to the patients. So, of course, this avoids the months of trial and error, the negative side effects, and we actually get a very good picture of what happens on the cellular level for every single patient line that we generate. So, back to our three patients. They're uh, currently they have, uh, the, the process that they're subjected to is kind of like uh, playing a game of darts. Except there's one problem. We're playing a game of darts, but in the dark. So we have no idea whether when we throw our dart, it's gonna land somewhere until we try. So for some patients, like Mr. R, it's gonna work great. You're gonna hit the target, you're gonna, you're gonna have the right effects for your medicine. But for other patients, you're gonna hit off target or you're not going to hit the target at all. And that's what we want to avoid as much as possible. With our patient-specific cell model, we're still playing a game of darts, right? We're still throwing our darts in towards the target, except now we've actually turned on the lights. And better yet, now we have this fancy laser pointer that we can actually kind of tell where our dart is going to land. Quite literally, we can predict at the cellular level what kind of medicine is going to work for which patient, which is going to avoid these patients the months of trials and tribulations that they were subjected to now. So why isn't this the new standard nowadays? Well, there's challenges that come with every single model that we have. In our case, the, uh, the challenges are the following. So the sample size of my study, the production time for these cell lines, and finally, the inherent limitations that cell lines have as a model. Now, we've discussed these three patients, and we have patients just like this enrolled in our study whose cells, uh, cell lines we're trying to generate. But the fact is, even if we're trying to recruit 250 patients and more, we might be missing some kind of demographic. We might be missing some kind of patient type. Or, or conversely, we might actually be biased towards one patient type or the other. So ideally, in, I in an ideal world, we'd be able to generate cells for everyone. But that's actually complicated by the fact that for each patient cell line, it takes about two to three months to generate. So that's a colossal amount of resources and work that gets put into this. So now we're not only juggling the very tangible benefits of having these cell lines, where we can help these patients in a very real, concrete way, with the very difficult task of generating these cell lines. And the truth is, I don't really have an answer for you today about how we're going to juggle this. This is part of why we are studying this and we're trying to understand the differences between each patient so that we have a better understanding on how to uh, manage these issues. And finally, drugs, as much as we want them to, are not always targeted. So for example, if I take a uh, medication for, drug fa uh, for heart failure, I hope that it's going to have benefits on my heart, right? And in the dish, that's exactly what we see. We can test it in a small little dish on heart cells. But what we're not accounting for is the different effects throughout the rest of our body, because drugs have very complicated interactions with other cells in our body that we're just starting to understand. If we're testing a medication on a heart in a dish, we would never know what kind of effects it could have on our brain, our liver, our reproductive system, and so on. I've got good news for you, though, because I had told you, right, that the stem cell can generate any cell of our body. 
So right now, our lab is really focusing on generating heart cells because that's kind of the short-term goal. The, the holy grail is to find the next cardiac repair therapy. But realistically, we could start generating other types of cells throughout the body in order to test these drug effects and really create a model that is kind of system-wide in a dish. So that's what I'm hoping for in the near future. And I would like to say that this project is really in, in its infancy. This is a project that matters to me because, like probably many people in this room, my, my, I know someone who has had heart disease. My grandfather actually battled with heart disease for a very long time before passing away. And in his case, um, he, wasn't actually, he, he didn't pass away from heart disease. He passed away from another illness for which he wasn't able to get treatment because his heart was so weak. The point I'm trying to make is that Heart disease might not be the thing that kills you, but it might prevent you from really living your life to, to the fullest and even uh, taking some kind of life-saving uh, strategy in the long term. So I'm hoping that this kind of model is going to kickstart research and put pers the, this personalized approach at the forefront of drug development rather than it being an afterthought, because we really need to get started on developing these repair therapies in a good way. So. I hope that we can be patient. I hope that we can have the patience at the forefront of this process, and we have to start somewhere. So thank you so much, and I hope that the promise that I give to you today about these personalized therapies becomes a reality for all of us at some point in the future. Thank you.